everybody, this is Captain Kyle, and I'm here with the very talented Robert Ricardo. You might know him from such things as Star Trek Voyager, Stargate, several series of Stargate, and most recently on The Flash. Sky has joined me today, so because she's a big fan of Rob, of Bob as well. So, so how are you doing today, Bob? I'm fine. I'm glad you clarified that, Kyle, because when you first opened the show there and you said, I'm here with Bob Picardo, I thought half the people would think I was a shapeshifter now <laughs> and, uh, you know, that I had transformed into that incredibly cool looking cat. But you made it clear that uh, <laughs> the cat has uh, 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 the cat's own identity and that I'm talking to you remotely. So I'm doing great. And thanks for having me. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. Um, I've enjoyed your work, obviously, uh, on Voyager. Um, maybe it's not so obvious, but I've enjoyed your work on Voyager, definitely in Stargate as well. Now, you're going to be appearing at Shore Leave uh, this July from the 7th through the 9th at Shore Leave 43, and that's in Hunt Valley, Maryland. So that's going to be a, hopefully a, a wonderful experience for everyone. Do you do a lot of conventions? You know, we get asked that question uh, quite a bit. Um, I don't know what a lot is. Certainly it's never bounced back since COVID for me, where I was doing as many as I was before. I would say by, you know, this calendar year, unless you count the Star Trek cruise as a seven day nonstop convention floating on, you know, international waters, I would say, uh, I will probably do only about four conventions at most five this year. Okay. Well, surely being one of them, you don't want to miss Bob and one of his, you know, few appearances on the, the East year. Coast. And yes. yeah, on the East Coast of the States, too. I haven't done a convention uh, in that area for quite some time. So I'm looking forward to it. Shore Leave is one of the great fan run conventions. I uh, It's got a terrific feeling. Um, they do wonderful charity uh, fundraising, and I'll be there with uh, my colleague from Voyager, Robert Duncan McNeil, and Penny Gerald, who uh, is a longtime friend. Um, uh, I don't remember when we we have uh, we have a mutual friend. So I met Penny socially, I guess, twenty years ago. She, of course, was on Deep Space Nine. She is presently starring on The Orville, uh, which I've also guest starred on, and she's Indeed. a delightful person. And then there are other guests too that I may not be aware of. Yeah, they they have a great lineup, but and we're glad that you can be part of it. As I mentioned earlier, you were just most recently on The Flash. What was that experience like working with that uh, crew? Well, I think you may know that I play a voiceover only. Dexter Miles, I think is the character's name. Right. So I've done a few appearances. I think, frankly, the post-production supervisor on that show is a big fan of mine from Star Trek. So I've done uh, a number of those shows, voiceover only. Um, other uh, other than uh, Star Trek, as you pointed out, I was on all three of the Stargate shows. Mm -hmm. I'm the only actor that played a regular part in both of the franchises. If I ever make an appearance on Star Wars, I will have made the trifecta, but we haven't done that yet, but it's, uh, it's always possible. And uh, I also, of course, was on the Orville. So I have some pretty good uh, sci-fi cred mm -hmm. additionally in the last season i was on uh mythic quest in their finale and csi vegas and the new um quantum leap yes. and ncis very briefly before i either killed myself or someone killed me i don't remember it's hard to keep track when you know yeah well when you get when you get to my age you play the guy who dies or the guy who's sick and may die or you know uh, that kind of, you know, so yeah. So yes, I think I, I think I commit suicide. And then the entire three hours on all three NCIS shows was trying to determine why I killed myself. Um, but it was a great job. You know, you work four hours and then they talk, talk about you for the next uh, three weeks. It's a good deal. Indeed. And uh, I guess your character was not nice enough to leave a note outlining the motivation for the no, I think it happened very suddenly that his uh, rationale for taking his own life was to keep something from being discovered. Um, I believe that was it. But we don't have to talk about this because that was only four hours of my life. Star Trek was, you know, <laughs> was uh, I think I made 168 hours of Star Trek, which, of course, took 168 hours times about times 60 hours to create. <laughs> Absolutely. The shooting process can be uh, quite a bit with multiple takes. And I hear there's 
There were a few antics on set. In fact, I was talking to Robbie um, about how he a, does a lot more directing now, and he would probably not be as uh, accommodating as they were on the Voyager <laughs> set. <laughs> yes, Robbie, I think Robbie ha has had a, a really wonderful career as a director, but he probably uh, uh, puts up with a little less goofing around on the set than he was part of as an actor on Voyager. We did uh, we did like to, uh, we, we had our fun. Different um, cast members were not only very funny, um, like uh, Robbie, Ethan Phillips, I count myself in the group, uh, Garrett. I mean, everybody had a really good sense of humor. Robert Beltran is a wonderful mimic and does terrific impressions. And we did, uh, we, we all played a certain number of practical jokes too. Tim Russ is a great practical joke player. And I'm sure Robbie regaled you with one or two of those stories as well. Well, Tim also let me know about his um, singing, I Feel Good, when he was supposed to be doing the mind meld. But how about, yes. how about you? Is there a particular prank that you played on someone else or was played on you that sticks out in your memory? Well, did Robbie or Tim tell you the other great Tim Russ story uh, of uh, – when uh, Tuvok has a dream that he appears naked on the bridge. Have you heard this story? I have not. I'm very interested. Well, then let me share that with you. There's an episode called, I think it might be called Altered States. I'm not sure. Uh, and I don't remember the plot, but I do remember that Tuvok has a dream that he that he walks out of the turbo lift onto the bridge nude. Now, whenever an actor has a partially clothed scene, they get a little body make as makeup as needed or whatever, but they come to the set in a bathrobe. They rehearse in a robe and underneath they have flesh colored briefs or G string or whatever. But what we didn't know is that Mr. Russ uh, had gone to wardrobe, gotten a long black knee sock, stuffed it and then tied it over his flesh colored briefs. So the, <laughs> the director, the director called action, Tim threw Now the rea it's a reaction shot on the eight of us. And, and we only see um, Tuvok's naked shoulder step into the foreground of the shot, and we're all supposed to react to him being nude. Well, Tim, when he threw off the robe on action, he, um, un, he revealed, or should I say unspooled, his, <laughs> um, his uh, well, the doctor might call it a program enhancement. <laughs> and of course, um, uh, my seven colleagues uh, burst into hysterical laughter. But I'm such a good actor, Kyle. I did not laugh because I thought, well, I'm his doctor. I've already seen it. Um, so uh, it was uh, it was a memorable, a memorable uh, moment. And uh, I don't know in, in the present stage of enlightenment uh, whether Tim would still do something like that. But all castmates, male and female and crewmates, uh, got a big kick out of uh, Tuvok's, um, as I said, well, let's let's put it this way. Um, it, his new, his, uh, it, he should say something like, uh, live very long and prosper. <laughs> and I'm sure if he was that very long, he would quite prosper. Um... Well, who knows? I mean, Vulcans, they, they have a very long lifespan and apparently they have a, <laughs> uh, the other parts of the, of the uh, anatomy follow suit. Right, though they only uh, get together every seven years or so, so right, I so it should be real, memorable. Uh, memorable, it, right? But it seems like in the meantime, carrying that burden around. Well, never mind. We can go on to a new subject. <laughs> Very nice. So, when you were on Stargate, how did that compare to the antics? Were there similar antics, or oh were yeah, there's a a lot of uh, fun on the uh, Star Trek set, and and David Hewlett. There aren't that many actors who really can crack me up. And I work with some great actors as a young man. I did a play on Broadway with Jack Lemmon and Jack Lemmon would try to make me laugh in rehearsal and especially even during performances in front of a Broadway <laughs> audience. He did little tricks to try to crack me up. Um, but David Hewlett uh, would actually make me burst out laughing, which is not easy to do uh, while we were shooting sometimes. Uh, so uh, we we did have a lot of laughs on that set. Uh, the great thing about Stargate is it's science fiction, but it's set in a secret program in in the present. Mm -hmm. So they're not as careful with the language in Star Trek because it's set in an imaginary future, uh, 250, 300 years out. 
the writers are understandably protective of the words as written. They don't want you to make it at all colloquial. They don't want a chance that you're going to inject any, uh, well, at the time, late 1998-isms or 1999-isms that we were shooting on Voyager into their 23rd century dialogue. But Stargate, you know, we you could ad lib. Once you, once you shot the scene as written, I often said to the showrunner and the director, hey, is it okay if I try a different line or make a joke here? And they would go, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, that was a freedom that we did not have on Star Trek unless we were spontaneous days in advance and had an idea for a joke. You called it in, got permission, and then they would put your joke or your changed line. If they liked it, it would be incorporated into the rewrite pages of the script. So on the day of, you shot exactly, and I mean exactly, what was on the page. So, uh, but Stargate, it was a much uh, loosey goosier experience. I don't know that spontaneous on the set of Voyager was actually the word if you have to plan it several days in advance. Not, the spontaneity loses its, uh, well, its spontaneity. That was, my, that was the irony of my comment. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, the way I usually frame it, and the joke is clear, is I say it's fine to be spontaneous on Star Trek as long as you're spontaneous five days in advance. When I lay it out that way, you get the fact that I was being ironic. There, there, yeah, spontaneous. I, I kind of caught that, but you know, I, <laughs> I wanted to make it clear. <laughs> because, you know, hopefully other people will be watching this and and coming to shore leave. Um, I hope so. Uh, you really have to see me in person. I want to say that to your audience right now. You can't quite enjoy or appreciate my extraordinary physical beauty unless you see me in person in uh, in Maryland. Uh, that's, you know, otherwise I just look to you the way I do now, which is not bad. But you should see me in person. I'm uh, positively uh, uh, like a celestial body radiating I, I couldn't agree more <laughs> yeah I, I have recently been in your you know about a month ago in your presence and my heart was a flutter there um, you go <laughs> see it, look it, <laughs> there's a reason why the cat hasn't left your lap the cat keeps staring at me on screen yeah oh, she can uh, sense but, these things <laughs> yes i now she's going to run away just to prove my point well you know they they can't well, okay, now she switched back. So there she is. Come on, honey. Hey, there you go. What is the cat a male or a female? Female. Her name and is Sky. Sky. Hey, Sky. Sky. <laughs> okay. Sky's She's twitching. <laughs> She's like, who is this guy, and why am I so oddly attracted? Uh, <laughs> so, so what I enjoyed about your character on Stargate is the evolution because you came in and you were basically you a douchebag. A douchebag. I'm glad you put it that way and not mm -hmm. me, but you, you were not to the most popular character. And then you turned out to, you know, have hidden depths and rise to the occasion and, you know, actually, you know, took command of, you know, Atlantis. And it, it was, uh, it was great to see. I wouldn't say you necessarily redeemed yourself because you didn't start at a place where you were like, you know, popular, but you evolved into someone that we could admire and sympathize with. I agree. The character was introduced as a douchebag. It was supposed to be a one shot guest star after the tragedy of the death of the um, Dr. Frazier. Was that her name? I think on yeah, the show. Janet, Janet Frazier. Yes. Yeah. Um, Dr. Frazier, uh, after her death, then my character is sent in to basically assess whose head will roll for that tragedy. And I interview all the other members of the um, of the Stargate team. And uh, I have no sense of humor. I am clearly out to find a scapegoat. And I had to shoot about 12 pages. The reason this happened is uh, the episode Heroes was intended to be uh, just a one-off episode with uh, Saul Rubinak playing an, a filmmaker who yeah. kind of uh, he's making a documentary uh, about the the base. And then something happens that he that he that they can't quite hide from his attention. And apparently the rough cut was so good. It was about eight minutes too long. And the producers went to the sci fi channel and said, why don't we make it a two parter? And we'll make part two our clip show, which they did every season. They took the best scenes 
from the prior episodes and then they wove a narrative. So they needed about 12 minutes of filler material and they thought, hmm, filler material, Picardo. So <laughs> they hired they hired me to come in and master 12 pages of yakking that tied together all of the clips is basically what it was. So I had a very long shooting day. I think I had to fly to England right after that for an appearance. That night, the producers took me out to dinner. They decided, hey, we kind of like this actor, but we painted ourselves in a corner by introducing him as such an unlikable guy. So they said they wanted to have me back, and I didn't see how they could, but they're, it's a tribute to their craft as writers that every time they brought me back, incrementally, my character decided, acquired a, a glimmer, glimmer <laughs> of a positive characteristic. So he went from being a complete douchebag to a douchebag who really believed in the importance of civilian oversight over a secret military operation. And then the third time I was back, I was a complete douchebag who really believed in the importance of civilian oversight over a secret military operation who really didn't want to be a complete douchebag anymore. <laughs> and, and so on and so on and so on. So I eventually developed, you know, some at least awareness of how people didn't like me and all of that. You know, uh, they had an episode, they had a crossover episode with Atlantis called The Swarm, I think, where these digital bugs are chasing us, where the big surprise is that Woolsey can outrun all of the younger people when it comes to running from danger. <laughs> so they, so now I'm a douchebag. I'm a coward. No one respects me. I have no command skills. And they called one day and said, we're going to make you the new commander of the Atlantis expedition. I said, how? I have uh, no skills. No, I'm a coward. I'm a douchebag. Nobody likes me. No one will follow me. And they said, don't worry about that. We'll work all that out. And I said, great. I would love to do it. And they did. They they really, they very cleverly got the audience on my side. Uh, in the first episode where I was a regular in season five, two wonderful things happen. I brief everybody in the briefing room and then I can't get out the door because I can't figure out how to make the door open. That was a great <laughs> moment that showed his, uh, how should I put this? his insecurity with his new command position and how he didn't quite feel at home and didn't quite know what to do. And then there's another moment where uh, Tila hands me her infant child as she runs off on a mission and I don't know how to handle a baby. Uh, and so there were little cute moments where they, the audience started to develop a glimmer of empathy for the Woolsey character. And, and it's all just good writing and very, you know, uh, cleverly trying to have the audience look behind my initial unpleasant character veneer and see something beneath it. And that the, the writers then nurtured into a guy who, you know, he'd, he'd spent his career um, evaluating the leadership qualities of people who really had the job, who knew what they were doing. And suddenly he went from the armchair quarterback to the game and he was put out on the field. And what was fun for me, because I was already in my 50s doing that part, uh, you know, because of the downturn in the economy around the same time I was cast in that in 2008 or whatever it was, there were a lot of people that had had successful careers, had retired and were forced to go back into the workforce because their retirement money had been lost by all of the secret, you know, bank shenanigans of the of the great, you know, the the. Uh, prime rate mortgage, you know, subprime mortgage debacle. Mm -hmm. um, people lost their, you know, their um, uh, money for retirement. And then suddenly older men and women were going back into the workforce. And I think that what happened with Woolsey was a was quite a nice um, comment or analog for that uh, situation that was happening in society because of our present economy at that time. So it really was a, a great experience. I, I think going from Star Trek to Stargate is a natural and easy transformation for an actor because Star Trek, as I said, is set in the future. It's much more con carefully controlled, the language. Stargate is a little looser. I think it would be harder to go from Stargate to Star Trek because, you know, you would be used to all this freedom that you suddenly didn't have anymore. <laughs> but uh, not to take anything away from my Star Trek experience, I love playing the Doctor. It was a terrific character arc you know to start with a blank slate a character with no affect whatsoever and 
to slowly grow a personality over seven years was a wonderful acting challenge and uh, an experience. I think I think you rise to the challenge of all your roles. And in defense of Woolsey, in his initial appearance, when you are doing an investigation, you have to kind of be a douchebag because you can't show the favoritism. You have mm-hmm. to be, you know, a hard ass to, to really get the reactions and figure out what actually happened. So, you know, I, I agree. I, I'm just I, didn't look... I got you to say douchebag on your own show. So I'm happy now we can do anything. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I've, I've said worse, trust me, um, but we'll try not to. <laughs> um, I noticed the cat ran away right around the douchebag conversation. I, I think she felt insulted on her behalf, even though mm-hmm. you called yourself that, you know, she was like, no, he is no douchebag. I am not listening right. to this. And that's and very kind. Away. Finest interpretation of the of recent events that I can possibly imagine. <laughs> I, I try to put spins on things. Um, so what attracts you to the more science fiction-y, fantastical roles? I mean, you have obviously been on less fantastic, more contemporary, you know, roles, but mm-hmm. you seem to have a flair for the sci-fi and fantasy, you know, realms. Well, thank you. Um I I would not have cast myself necessarily in Star Trek, but once I understood my character and I understood the quality of the storytelling, because I was not very knowledgeable about the the Star Trek saga when I was cast in Voyager, I had to study up and, 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 and see how good the writing was. But once you become a popular character in one popular science fiction uh then it's then that fan that audience is interested in watching your other work and they particularly like it i think when they see you in other science fiction but i have found the star trek fan audience to be loyal across the board they'll they'll uh they like to see me in other shows or they if i pop up in a movie or whatever and even the ones that have seen me on stage in theater and musicals and whatnot are always happy uh to see me uh returning to my stage roots. So I can't say that I, I that there's anything about me as an actor that made me particularly well suited to science fiction. I will simply say that playing a very popular character in science fiction encourages you to get more science fiction parts. And that's what you know, people who cast these things uh, are aware of that, too. There's certain things I cannot understand. For example, I think it's a brilliant idea to put me on a, you know, on a one scene cameo on Doctor Who. I think that would be, that would break the internet if they did that, because we're, <laughs> you know, when, when I, uh, when I became the doctor with no name in the American science fiction franchise, I didn't entirely realize that we were ripping off the doctor with no name in the British science fiction franchise. But I think it's high time we, we, we did a joint wink at the camera over that. It could happen. You know, it just takes the right person in, in uh, the BBC uh, writing department to go, oh, what a lovely idea. I think we could do that. You know, and then you know, next time you're in London, Mr. Picardo, why don't you give us a call and we'll we'll just pop you into a scene and the doctor can bump into you and go, uh, uh, pardon me, doctor, uh, pardon me, doctor, and then it'll be over. Yeah, or, or hello, I'm I'm the doctor. Yeah. So am I. You yeah. know, <laughs> something along those lines. Oh, the, how very odd. Yes, I don't know. <laughs> in any case, uh, it, it could happen or, you know, who the heck knows, maybe not. So I also know that you have taken um, roles, at least a role in a uh, in something that was probably not exactly um, your most financially lucrative, um, the surge of power. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how did that come about? And, uh, you know, what are your feelings towards actors of your caliber, you know, lending, how shall we say, a bit of authority to these, you know, more independent and fan-driven films? Well, that's a good question. I think that the um, I think the message of inclusion of the Surge of Power movies is a good one. I think they're intentionally campy and, and, and silly, but they have a good heart. And that's what appealed to me. I, I mean, I, I uh, play, you know, uh, I, I, the, the most recent one, I don't know if it's completed yet, but I've been in, I think, two of them. And I've been in other small movies. Uh, Some of them turn out better than others. But I only I only do it if I think uh, I I have a rule. 
here's my two role, rules. Uh, I can't be the ba- the worst thing in the movie. I Hopefully, I will elevate this. When I'm on camera, I have to be better. If I'm the worst thing in the movie, or I think I will be, then I won't do the movie. But, but seriously, uh, if the movie has a good heart and a good message, or if I'm playing a real evil character, if at least the character gets what he deserves, but I find the journey or the challenge of the character interesting, I will do that. I'm in this other thing uh, on the internet called Space Command. I think the first episode is available for free. Highly recommend it. I have a really interesting character in that. The reason I did that was to work with the great Doug Jones. Doug Jones plays the hologram in that. And I, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, the artificial intelligence. Yeah. Is he a hologram or is he an android? I can't remember exactly. The point is he's the artificial intelligence and I am the human in that. And there were it was fun to visit some of the same themes that I played on Star Trek at the other end of the reality table, so to speak. Um, so you often get uh, challenges and that that there I have a remarkably emotional scene in that, which I'm very proud of as one of my scenes in it. And, and it's great to be on camera with Doug. So, you know, there's there's got to be a, there's got to be a reason because um, that you fit present some sort of challenge and you think it has a good heart. Uh, other than that, yes, we do get paid for them, but usually we don't get paid well enough to have that be the compelling reason to do it. <laughs> yes, do it. yes. And we and those of us who have spent a lifetime performing, we love to perform. There's always that too. If it's like you know, uh, we we enjoy working. Which, which actually kind of leads me, um, bringing back to Star Trek, with what would you say, other than the the financials. Um, start being part of the Star Trek universe has given you as a person. What is it? What has it given me? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, it's given me a signature role in life. The fact when you're on a Star Trek series for a number of years, just from the sheer numbers of how long the the, the uh, your work is in the marketplace, the number of countries it's shown in around the world, that becomes the role for which you are most known as an actor. It can be a, a, a curse as well as a blessing, but by and large, it's a blessing. That means that your work in, in, in your Star Trek iteration and your role is seen by more people than anything else you'll ever do. And uh, if, it's, if it's good, positive, optimistic entertainment, the way Star Trek is, I think that's a good thing. I think we, you know, if you're Star Trek fans know that the, the primary attraction of it is it's optimism. That humanity has a future, a future in space in which technology and science can empower humanity without destroying it. There's so much apocalyptic science fiction, especially post 9-11, where where you have a vision of these few stragglers that have survived a nuclear holocaust that are scratching around trying to find enough food to stay alive. I mean, some apocalyptic science fiction is very thought provoking. It's very good, but it's depressing. You can't get around that. Star Trek is optimistic, and we all love to dream of a future where we all get along, we all work side by side in harmony, we're all judged not on the basis of our color or our uh, alien background, but on the content of our character. And most importantly, Star Trek posits a world where learning, gaining understanding of our place in the universe is important enough to go out and explore. We're not out looking for, you know, cheap materials for car, for electric car batteries or cell phone batteries. We're out there trying to understand what it means to be human and understand our position in this glorious universe that we live in. So those are all positive reasons to love Star Trek. So I'm proud to be part of the franchise. I have met an extraordinary uh, group of colleagues through Star Trek, Um, all the actors with, you know, I would say there's not a bad uh, apple in the barrel. I mean, I'm much closer to some people than others, but I've met some wonderful people that are other actors in other Star Trek franchises or my own. And uh, and also we have the opportunity to visit loyal fans all over the world, who many of whom credit us with changing their lives, either inspiring them to go into careers, uh, perhaps of medicine if they love my character or 
more often than not in science, technology, even space exploration. So that is very gratifying to think that a form of entertainment can even help change people's lives, people who love it and watch it. So uh, I am uh, proud to have the signature role. And I'm also proud that Star Trek, which has introduced me to so many real people in science and exploration who credit Star Trek with inspiring them. I've been a member of the Planetary Society, first their um, advisory board starting in the 90s when our show was on the air. And the last seven years, I'm on the executive board we're led by Bill Nye, the science guy, our organization, which is a space advocacy nonprofit to engage the public and interest them and make them feel they're a part of the future of space exploration, that they have a voice in it. And uh, if you don't know anything about it, I urge you to go to www.planetary.org, find out about it. I make a lot of cool videos on different subjects asking questions. I interview fascinating people. I go to Jet Propulsion Laboratory and I I look in the clean room and see the giant reflector on the James Webb Space Telescope, which is now launched in space, doing a great job and a huge success for NASA. I was in Washington, D.C. less than two weeks ago, sitting with two scientists around tables with senators and key staff members of senators talking about um projects at NASA that, that that our group, the public who love space, feel passionate about and urging um, are urging the senators to support a 7% increase in NASA's budget so that all of the important projects continue to be financed and we continue to remain the number one space capable country in the world that, we, that America remains the leader in that area. That's a title with all the competition we're getting from China. That's a title that we have to really fight for and continue to earn. So if you're not a space fan, let's put it this way. If you're not a member of the Planetary Society, but you are a space fan <laughs> and you want to be part of a community of people who feel like you, then join the Planetary Society. And of course, I'll put the link down the bottom. And the, our future is obviously out there, you know, mm -hmm. so there's plenty of stuff we can learn here. Um, to get back to your roles, obviously, Star Trek Voyager was your signature role, very well known. What role have you taken that you wish was more known? Well, boy, um, often when you work on stage, you wish that more people could see it. I work in small theater productions sometime. I work in, in a theater group. Sometimes we just do it for each other. Um, so some of my theater roles, especially... When I was a young man, theater is ephemeral. You know, I would love to be able to sit down and watch one of my leading roles on Broadway from my early 20s. That would be great. I recently had the experience of seeing me in Bernstein's Mass when I'm 19. There was a video made for public television. It was in the vaults for years. And for a while, it popped up on the Internet. So I got to see myself singing and dancing with a giant self-grown head of hair like this, this big. <laughs> Um, uh, at age 19. Uh, but I would say, um, and I've been in some uh, movies that I wish more people had seen, but by and large, I, I have no complaints. I feel lucky. Uh, I still love acting. That's the most important thing. I mean, after a career that near, nearly spans 50 years as a professional, I think it'll be 50 years. Let me think. Uh, in three more years, I will hit the half century mark as a professional actor. Uh, the fact that I that I still love doing it is really um, uh, a source of joy uh, to me. And I feel very grateful um, to God, uh, to my family for still encouraging me and for the amazing group of colleagues I've met as an actor and also for the fans out there who enjoy my work, let me know they enjoy my work perhaps follow me on Instagram and Twitter. They are interested in finding out about the Planetary Society. They support what I do and are interested, even if we don't necessarily agree on political issues, because I found that out on Twitter that, you know, <laughs> uh, that many people who love Star Trek don't agree with me at all on my political points of view. The point is, if we all remain courteous and, uh, you know, uh, in social media, I think we that the hope is always that we can still, we can compromise, 
and we can still see each other's points of view without having to devolve into name calling. Indeed, indeed. Uh, is there anything new that you can share with us that you're working? Um, ooh, 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 keyword? Um, can you share? <laughs> uh -huh. um, well, let's see. This <clears throat> I recently I just got back from shooting a short film in uh, New York, playing uh, a sociopathic uh, therapist. Um, short films, uh, often they're young directors that are very talented that want to get considered for feature work. Um, so that short film is called Dispatchment. No idea when it will be done, but they can, if you check on my social media, you'll find out in the future. Uh, I had a great, great fun working on a Hallmark Christmas movie I love Christmas movies. I've been in them before um, earlier in the year, and that'll premiere late this year. Um, and other than that, um, there there are always things in the offing um, that uh, could happen and might happen, but there is uh, absolutely nothing definite that I could share. I will say this. It was very gratifying to me how successful season three of Star Trek Picard was and what it did was not and it's a great credit not just to the wonderful actors from the next generation but it's a big credit to terry metallis the uh showrunner producer who was an assistant to brandon braga our producer on voyager in his 20s uh he did a terrific job crafting a very emotionally satisfying finale and it also showed i think the uh it showed paramount that there is a passion among the fan base to still see the legacy Star Trek actors, you know, even though we all got older, like everybody does. Mm -hmm. And that, I thought, uh, I thought that was really good for the franchise, that a rising tide rises, uh, raises all boats. So I think the franchise is in very good health, um, you know, with uh, the two animated shows and the three live action shows, even though Discovery's now come to an end. So I think it's in great, sh great shape. And there's always the chance that the old faces will pop up again, but absolutely enough. Don't read into my words because there ain't nothing definite. <laughs> right. Just, uh, just pray to, uh, whatever entities. Oh, just keep pray. writing. <laughs> just keep saying, I love seeing these old guys in their sixties and seventies. We love them. <laughs> right. But you, it's amazing. You've had a 50 year career and what are you like 43 now? 43. Yes. Yes. If you count, really, here, I'll, I'll saw off my ankle and you can count the rings. I'm 43 <laughs> and a half. Yeah. Uh, please don't <laughs> saw off your ankle. This, you know. I'm glad you said that because it would mess up the rug here. It, it'd be a disaster. Yeah. And, it, it, and well, how would I make it to shore leave, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, and yes, please come to shore leave. Um, it's a great, it's one of my favorite shows of the year. Mm -hmm. Again, it's July 7th through the 9th, and you get to meet wonderful people like Bob here. And yes, uh, Robert Duncan McNeil, and they have uh, Ben Browder and Claudia Black. They they have an amazing group. Any and look, Johnson? I get to be in the Star Trek group, the Stargate group, and the Orville group. So I am a triple threat, folks. All right? Yes, and Peter Macon um, will be there as well from the Orville, speaking of that. So... And and even more guests. So go to uh, shoreleave.com. Um, links in the description. Links also to the Planetary Society and, you know, all the Bob socials will be on there. Anything you want to close with for your fans? Ah, uh, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. How about that? <laughs> no, that uh, is thank perfect. <laughs> you. Thank you for watching. I look forward to seeing you at Shore Leave or someplace else in the near future. Thanks for the conversation. Check out Sky and make sure Sky the Cat doesn't need water or food. And uh, I think that's it. I, I would have to say EMH out. Deactivate? EMH deactivate. <laughs> but uh, thanks, everyone, for watching. And as always, have fun and follow your fandom. Hi, this is Bonnie Gordon, and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Make sure to like and subscribe before the self-destructs in five, four, three. Two, one, just kidding. Have fun and follow your fandom.